So it's my pleasure to have with us uh, today, Dr. Michelle Frisch, who is, I would describe as an entrepreneur who created the Meds MASH program, which is a program to support adults for maintaining um, uh, and uh, their lives, their independent living as they age. Uh, she previously managed the, uh, Alma, uh, I think it's Almance? Alamance. Alamance. Medication Assistance Program, a nonprofit program with the Alamance Regional Medical Center, which essentially provided medication management. She was the founding chair of the, in the clinical pharmacy and social administrative area at Notre Dame University of Maryland University. Uh, she's recognized uh, as a healthcare hero by the Maryland Daily Record for her role in creating a pro bono community health service. Uh, she's also recognized with numerous uh, healthcare leadership awards. So it's my privilege to welcome uh, Dr. Frisch with us. Thank you for asking me. So glad to be here. Thank you. So um, this is part of our, uh, you know, pharmacy uh, in history of pharmacy and in, in, and pharma, in pharmacy leadership. So what uh, the first question I want to ask you is to share with us your journey, your journey as you developed in your career. Uh, and as you reflect on that, you may wish to include key events that helped shape and impacted that journey and also uh, key people that may have uh, influenced you in this journey. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to do that because I would definitely not be here without some very key people um, who allowed this to happen. So I'll try to hit the highlights, but it, it, it's been a fun, exciting journey. And I know everyone says this, but if you had told me at the start where the journey would have taken me, I would, would never have believed it. Um, so I went to pharmacy school to be an astronaut to do electrophoresis research on the space lab. And uh, I went to Purdue, so I had access to astronauts. I mean, I actually had um, one of the active astronauts doing that, Charles Walker, called me in my dorm room and gave me sort of the, the plan, what I needed to do as far as internships and, and uh, my PhD and how to make that happen. And then Challenger exploded, changed everything. I um, made a change then and decided that I wanted to get my clinical degree, my PharmD, rather than my PhD, and be in pediatric oncology. And then Elizabeth Farrington was my preceptor on a month of um, the, probably the most I've ever learned in a month in this lifetime. And I realized I couldn't handle it. I absolutely, you know, praise God for the people that do it, but I couldn't handle it. And then I found uh, a nurse who told me that um, you've got to find that place where, where you can thrive. And when you lose people, you realize you learned things you can apply to the next people. That was hard. That took a lot of introspection. And I realized geriatrics was that for me. So I've been in geriatrics ever since. Um, in my residency, I was asked if I had any interest in academia. And I said, absolutely not. And I was in academia for the next 25 years. And I continue to teach. Um, these days, I teach online to PA students and physical therapy students and nursing students and, and different things. It's not all pharmacy anymore. Um, my first department chair was a, he and, and several of the faculty were just huge mentors and really kind of set the stage for me to have, find success in academia and in practice. I um, had a, I worked at Leavenworth VA in Leavenworth, Kansas, and it was one of those Grex geriatric research and education centers. So we had the team. It had the, the doctors, the nurses, the physical therapists, psychologists, occupational therapists, um, social workers. I mean, the team, the big team. Mm -hmm. That was awesome. And we had um, hospital care, domiciliary, which was sort of like home care. Um, a, a step-down unit, a nursing home, an outpatient clinic, so many different sorts of practices. And that, that was fantastic. And even in the 90s, pharmacists had great autonomy in um, practice it, it, within, and very collaborative in that setting. And then between my job and my husband's, we ended up moving. Um, and I wanted to see if that could be done outside of the VA setting. 
And so went to a smallish community health center, which was Alamance, loved that community, never ever intended to leave there, was able to serve an underserved geriatric population prior to Medicare D. So they didn't often have insurance to cover their medications and they were uninsured in other ways. And so we got really inventive and also used patient assistance programs to sustain that group. And I remember the hospital administrators, when I went there, I was to work with a particular group of internal medicine physicians and be their geriatric resource. And so we signed on the dotted line in March. And when I got there in July, they had had a fight and disbanded. <laughs> and the um, administrators of the hospital said, well, if you can save us more money than you cost us, do what you want. And that was, that was a challenge and that was fun. Ended up at one point with 14 people in this clinic. And not only did we show that this frail population who normally would have an increase in utilization of hospital and ER, you know, they just wanted us to try to flatten it. And we were able to actually decrease it by providing coordinated care for this high-risk wow. population. So I never intended to leave that. But Annie Lynn became a friend way back um, when I was pregnant for my first child. It was before the Family Medical Leave Act. Um, I had had someone tell me early in my interviewing for academic positions that if I got pregnant during tenure track, I would never make it. So I had that in my head. And I went to um, a American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy, which is where the faculty gather. And a group of women leaders, I believe you were part of this, formed a chance for the women faculty to get together because we were the huge minority at the time. Mm -hmm. There were no female deans, maybe one female chair. I mean, it, it just didn't exist at that time. And I mentioned to someone that I was pregnant and I didn't know how to negotiate that with my um, administration. And uh, someone introduced me to someone who introduced me to Annie Lynn and she was such a godsend. She actually flipped over her business card and wrote her home number and said, 2 a.m. baby questions, you call me. Who does that to a stranger? <laughs> wow. So when she became Dean at Notre Dame and she called and said, would you come up and, and interview. I said, I, I don't do cities. She said, Michelle, just interview. So anyway, I came up. I live in Baltimore now. I've been down in the city um, on many occasions. And uh, then the, my current phase came from realizing I saw so many people in the hospital that didn't need to be there. Once you got to know their story, or once I saw them in clinic, but they were having that health decline, once I saw them, I realized, man, I could have prevented, I, we, healthcare, could have prevented that. Um, and so I started on this quest to find ways to do prevention. And so my, my, my quest is to work with people from like 55 to 75 who are healthy and doing well, and work with them to, um, stay that way, to know how to ask good questions and interact with the healthcare system, to clean up their medication regimens, to do those things. So I started that company you mentioned called MedsMash. And MASH is mature adults safe at home. And all the boomers rejected me. They're like, yeah, that's not me. That's my parents. So <laughs> MedsMash now treats people that are 80 to 120, you know, the, the old, old. And I, it took me two years to figure out, well, what word will be okay to talk about with my desired um, target, and retirement was that word. So where I'm focusing now is retirement wellness strategies, and if anyone wants to check that out, it's retirewellness.com. So that's where I've landed at this point. Oh, wow. Oh, I really appreciate that. That's Fascinating to say the least. Um, anyway, um, so uh, what do you think is going to be your legacy in 20 years? And I rephrase that because people say legacy, you know, um, reflecting on what are you most proud of in terms of your contribution that has helped advance the pharmacy profession? Well, you know what? The, the other thing that we haven't talked about that I'm most proud of is something called Medipreneurs. 
-hmm. So many like medicine and preneurs like entrepreneurs. And that is um, once I left academia and became an entrepreneur, I found two, or they found me, two other entrepreneurial pharmacists. And we realized that we're not taught to do this or back us old people, we weren't taught to do this. And how to run a business is so different than, than what we're taught to do as pharmacists. And so the three of us were able to muddle through together and really help each other. And we're like, well, if we can, if three of us can help each other, I'm sure there are other people out there. Let's pull them all together. And that is Medipreneurs. And so it's a group of very innovative pharmacists and now it's growing into other healthcare professions. Um, who are either starting their own business or working within a small business, or we're calling them entrepreneurs, people that are doing really innovative things within their health system or wherever they're working. And so to get together with this group is just like lighting fire under something. It's so exciting and inspiring. And so not only do I wanna be a resource for a healthy transition to retirement, I love what Medipreneurs is doing, and I hope that has a real long life. Long life, you're gonna get very good. Wow, that's just, you, you're making me very excited. <laughs> <laughs> I can see the passion and the excitement. I love it. Um, so, uh, advice for students in their professional journey, and when I say advice for students in their journey as they develop as leaders, leaders to help advance the profession. Absolutely, and that's that's what I'm hoping. I think times are ripe for our profession to make those leaps that we have talked about since I entered the profession 30 something years ago. Um, we, we've talked about it, but the, now's the moment. I think we can do that and we can talk about why I think that if you want, but sure. I encourage students to be independent thinkers and to think of themselves as far beyond a pharmacist. Um, I think one of the disservices our profession has done is we're really good at building ourselves up internally Pharmacists know what other pharmacists are doing and we know where we want our profession to go and we're in our own little bubble and you get out of our bubble. The, the community, like citizens don't understand what we do. Doctors don't often understand what we do. Nurses, therapists, I, I'm still astounded. It's gotten much, much better in the years I've been doing this, but I'm still astounded how many people have such a narrow view of what a pharmacist does. I still have people say things like, why isn't that a technical degree? All you do is count and put it in a bottle. I mean, I've been hearing that my whole life and people, there are still people who see that. So I encourage students to be independent thinkers, to think of themselves as part of the team, not, not just the pharmacist, but a huge essential part of the team and be open to further developing that role um, for themselves and for, for all of us. I'm looking at my notes always here. And the other thing, and you can tell I'm a teacher, always do what's right for your patient. Don't do what's quick or easy or gonna get you the most acclaim or the most dollars. That will come back to bite you. Mm -hmm. You need to be in this for the patients. And if you're always doing what's right for the patient, things will work out well. I've had, um, well, we can get into all sorts of stories of, of how that doesn't turn out, but yeah, I would love always, to hear them. But yeah. not now. <laughs> yeah, always, always keep the patient at the center and be a collaborator. Yeah. I think if you do that, the future is very bright. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I know you would have lots of great words. Uh, you know, it, it, it excites me. And we'll talk after we're done recording here. Um, so as we're, um, you know, as this course, uh, some of these interviews will be embedded in this history course in leadership and pharmacy leadership. And as we study the decade of the 2020s, one of the key events in that decade will be the COVID-19 pandemic. There is no, no doubt that will be a key event in the 2020s. And like other key events in our history, uh, key events external to our profession actually influences and shapes our profession and, and often creates opportunities for our, our profession. Would you wish to comment about how you see the COVID-19 pandemic being this window of opportunity and will shape our profession? So you have to know my notes, half my page is on this. So cut me <laughs> off when you've had enough. Oh, I suspect. Okay, starting, I'll go like this. <laughs> starting at the beginning of March, 
um, Medipreneurs, we started pulling together healthcare professionals and we're, we're looking for people in all the professions and we're having these brainstorms and you all, everyone, if this is still happening, when you watch this video, please join us. Oh, great. They're, they're going to be the second Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. Eastern on Zoom. But we started this back in March and so many things. So I will tell you what were the topics in March and April were um, telehealth exploding. I, I've been fortunate. I've been using telehealth since I started my business. So for about five years and I've been able to explore and experiment with different platforms and um, really am excited about what telehealth does now and what it's going to be able to do very soon. So we've talked a lot about that. We've talked about um, all the academic people on there were talking about creating virtual rotations and ways to to continue to to give you all a great education even with some limitations that are happening and entrepreneurial pharmacists are stepping up and saying pick me pick me i'd love to have students on rotation and they would get both the virtual and the entrepreneur perspective um Increased efficiencies. So like I'm working, I'm doing some pharmacogenomic stuff with a lab and they've learned that they used to go into like a particular nursing home or assisted living three to four times a week for blood draws. And I mean, this is simple, but they're now very efficient. They know everything that needs to be done for that week and they do it on one day to decrease exposure of their staff going into that nursing home. But I would imagine that's an efficiency that will stay. Um, we've talked about, um, those are the new ones. Oh, one that came up recently is um, there's pressure on the primary care provider. So it's like, it's like all of health has gotten delayed with all of this. People with chronic conditions have not had their regular visits. People, we're finding more and more evidence that people have had like minor heart attacks and not sought care because they're afraid of COVID, had strokes, had, you know, big things that are now, as things open up, going to just be entering care and we're going to be way, way, way behind. And so I've heard a number of people talk about what an opportunity that opens for pharmacists come alongside those primary care providers, sort through, triage, get the important data from those patients and help them figure out who needs to be seen right away and who could be managed with giving some autonomy to the pharmacist until the doctor gets to them. So many people have talked about that the need for clinical pharmacists is going to go up and up and up while on the retail side, it's going down and down and down. So, so it's not like pharmacy is going away. I think we're finally making that shift to a more clinical perspective, which is what we've always wanted. And then in the recent, most recent um, brainstorm, which was this past week, really got into what's going on and just under this groaning of our society and all of the things going on. And so we started talking about things like pharmacies having a plan for seamless patient care if the pharmacy is destroyed. Because that pharmacy that was burned in Minneapolis two or three weeks ago now, um, it supported a lot of the nursing homes in that area. And so a lot of people's health was jeopardized by not having availability of that pharmacy. And I'm in Baltimore. We had this experience five years ago where we lost two pharmacies. And um, I had a couple of colleagues who the second the pharmacy was um, endangered, Thankfully, down by Hopkins, we had a, a pharmacy, a CVS pharmacy that hadn't opened the doors yet. So it was up and functioning, but hadn't opened the doors. Mm -hmm. So the timing sort of was perfect. My two colleagues ran, went to that pharmacy and started transferring all of those prescriptions from the pharmacy that was actively burning and making the plan and ordering the supplies and getting everything lined up to be able to continue with the care that was going to be lost from that pharmacy. So not plans I think we've really made before, but, but they're reality now. Um, we need um, more diversity in our leadership throughout the profession that reflects our pharmacy, our, our community. 
Um, we as pharmacists have a big role to play with decreasing disparities in healthcare. Um, you know, recognizing those that they definitely exist and, and how do we enhance the care for our pop all populations, like, kind of like the clinic I had back in North Carolina. Um, one pharmacist was really upset that a local pharmacy was giving free COVID testing. Well, that sounds like a nice thing for the community, but it just reinforces that pharmacists at pharmacist services are free. And we're never going to survive if we're free. We've got to be paid for what we do. And so that free COVID testing was kind of going against important steps that other people were trying to make to have viable services, you know, to, to um, get compensated for what they're doing. Um, we need to coordinate, and we've always said this, but now I think the moment is the brightest that we coordinate um, reimbursement pathways for pharmacists because we we've got the skills we've more than enough demonstrations that what we do is effective so we um now need to coordinate to be part of the billing schema and have specific uh billing codes for what we do as pharmacists not always specifically within the 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 physical framework of a physician's office like what i do is from home Mm -hmm. Exactly. Wonderful. Well, uh, Michelle, Dr. Fresh, I really appreciate your taking the time to share with us your passion, and it's it's been wonderful. I, I'm already stimulated by this. Uh, thank you again. You're welcome. Oh, can I add one thing? Yes, Another absolutely. Another thing that really shaped my path was um, to do a public health service co-step commissioned uh, officer student training experience program, whether it's COSTEP or something else, I encourage all the students to jump at those unique opportunities because wow. they open incredible doors. Excellent. And I'll be quiet. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.